Good morning. Welcome back to Planet Doug Behind the Scenes for, uh, I don't know what day it is. I know the date. I know it's December 5th, but the date is Tuesday. Tuesday, December 5th. And uh, I guess I have a lot of things going on at the same time. I'll have to see if I can get my thoughts in order to tell my stories. Um, the big one going on right now is that a vul the volcano that I was living beside in uh, Sumatra in Indonesia, it just erupted like yesterday or the day before. Um, like when I was there, there for quite a long time I was staying in this small village on the, uh, the slopes of a volcano just outside of the city of Bukitinggi, and the volcano is called Mount Marapi. And it is the most active volcano on Sumatra. I even talked about that in a couple of videos. It hasn't erupted for a long time, but it's still in terms of the frequency of its eruptions, it is the most active volcano on Sumatra. So as I was living right there on the slopes of that volcano for quite a long time. And when I was going around on the scooter trips and uh, things like that, I left my bicycle and all of my luggage uh, in the house in the village where I was staying. So I left it there in storage. And then I got a message. I, like, I didn't see this in the news or anything, but I got a message from uh, Planet Doug subscribers telling me, he's like, hey, did you hear, you know, the volcano erupted? And at first I thought they mixed it up with another volcano because that happens all the time. On Sumatra, it's Mount Marapi with an A, but there's also a volcano on Java called Mount Marapi with an E. And Mount Marapi is the most active volcano in all of Indonesia. And in fact, there was a big eruption of Mount Marapi on Java, uh, like eight months ago or something like that. It was a big story in the news. Anyway, that volcano keeps erupting all the time. And every time it does, people reach out to me and say, oh, your volcano erupted. And I have to explain, no, 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 that's Marapi. I'm on Marapi. And they're very, very far apart on two totally different islands. So when I got all these messages about the volcano erupting, I just thought, yeah, it's the same same thing. It must have been the Java volcano that's erupting, not the Sumatran volcano. But then I went looking in the news and sure enough, it was actually my, what I think of as my volcano, the one that I spent a lot of time around um, in Sumatra. It erupted. Uh, it wasn't nearly as big an eruption as the, the one eight months ago on Marapi, but uh, still looked uh, fairly serious. Uh, I don't think there was a lot of like lava flow or anything like that, but it sent up a, you know, a plume of ash three kilometers into the air. That's what all the news stories are saying. And I've been around volcanoes like that in the past, like volcanoes that are just sort of sputtering all the time, like just have sort of a constant eruption going on. Every morning you wake up and you'll see like a little bit of a plume coming off the volcano. Um, there's a town in Sumatra called uh, Berastagi, and there's a volcano beside Berastagi. I spent some time there in the past, and it's you know, constantly erupting, and the people there have to live with the ash. I mean, ash just covers everything all the time, so you're always sweeping up volcanic ash and rinsing off your cars and your motorcycles because everything gets covered in volcanic ash all the time. And that's what they're dealing with in, in my village and in Bukatingi, that whole area, you know, that massive volcanic cloud is, you know, just sending volcanic ash over the whole area. And people that I know in the village have been sending me photographs and uh, video clips of that, you know, the initial eruption. I don't know whether it's still going on now, like as far as I know, it could just be erupting continuously now and, and sending more ash up into the sky. I'm not really sure. I haven't, I haven't checked the news this morning. But uh, yeah, in recent, uh, recent hours, they've started to report some fatalities. At the, at the beginning, the stories were saying, you know, there was this big you know, volcanic cloud went up, but there was no structural damage. It's not like, you know, villages were wiped out. And there was nothing like that going on. But it turns out there were about as as this is what they know about that there were about 70 hikers on the mountain on the volcano and i guess it's a very popular volcano for people to climb on the weekend things like that 
and uh, they knew of at least 70 who registered to climb to the top of the volcano. And there were probably quite a few more than 70, but there were 70 that had registered. And so far, the last articles I checked, um, 11 they found so far have died. And um, I guess they, they were close to the crater, maybe even inside the crater, I don't know. I, find, I always find this very frustrating with modern news. You get so little information and the way my brain works. I, I want to know everything. I need the details. You can't just write an article that says 11 hikers died. Okay, well, I need to know where they were. Like, where were they on the volcano? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about a, uh, you know, gruesome interest or anything. I'm just interested in facts and science and details. And uh, I want to know, how did they die? Um, so, like, were they right in the crater and then they, they, they suffocated because of the ash? They couldn't breathe? Or was it heat from the eruption? Was, was there actual lava and was, like, superheated steam? Like a, um, what do you call that when a, a cloud, um, I can't think of the name. I'm going to look it up right now because I hate not knowing these things. I got it. Um, it's called a pyroclastic flow. So when there's like a major eruption, there can be like a, a, a cloud of hot gas and ash and, you know, flowing down the slope of the volcano and moving at a very high rate of speed. And they call that a pyroclastic flow. And that can kill people. So were these hikers um, killed in the pyroclastic flow? Were they, you know, I want to know all these details, but... The media these days seems to be a lot of copy and paste. You look online and you think you're looking at 50 articles about this eruption, but really there was only one, and then every news agency just copy and pastes the same information. So there's no point even scanning the news because everybody reports the same thing. And something I saw just now said 11 dead and 14 still missing that they know about. So anyway, it'll take a long time before... Uh, the details are subtle, but yeah. Yeah, when you live on the slopes of a volcano, it is, uh, yeah, it's a risk. The thing can go off at any time. And uh, I guess, luckily, uh, I'm not, I wasn't there anymore. You know, I'm not there right now. I'm, uh, I'm here. So yeah, I've, I've reached out and I've touched base with a few people that I know there and uh, every, everybody's fine. They're just busy, you know, cleaning. They got all the volcanic ash everywhere, you know, wiping it and uh, sweeping everything up, things like that. Something else that is going on. Uh, <laughs> I, had a, I had a bit of an adventure this morning, and I kind of want to talk about that adventure a little bit. And that involves, um, I have plans right now, believe it or not, to return to Sumatra. When I left from Sumatra last time, I took the ferry from... Dumai to Port Dixon in Malaysia and I had all kinds of ideas in my head for what I was going to do none of them involved returning to Sumatra but things kind of spun out of control in my life a lot of um, poor planning perhaps on my part and I find myself right now needing to leave Malaysia again and I'm also sort of switching modes like when I went to Sumatra last time, I brought my bicycle with me and it was a little bit of an experiment. I wanted to see if it's possible to ride a bike long distances and shoot YouTube videos at the same time and have those videos be a little bit interesting to a general audience. And uh, that did not work out at all. Um, so much work and so much trouble, so much effort, so much time required just to get to a place like Sumatra with your bicycle. So that's the first part of the problems. And then when I got there, when I landed in Dumai, I got sick to my stomach, so I couldn't really hit the ground running. I was quite sick in Dumai for a while. I had to, I had to recover before I could even start cycling. Then I finally got on the bike, and on the very first day that I rode from Dumai, to the next town up the highway, which was about, I don't know, 80 kilometers, something like that, my knees gave out. So I guess maybe I just wasn't in good enough shape to ride that far 
on the very first day and I basically blew out my knees and then I was really unable to cycle as I planned and I just my original plan to be honest was to make it a very short trip it was just about supposed to be like a 30-day trip because you get a 30-day visa on arrival and then I was just going to ride to Bukatingi, ride back get back on the ferry and and leave again then it was supposed to be very quick and uh, yeah it turns out the whole trip kind of took like a year because I went back and forth from Sumatra to Malaysia and then doing different things and and that at every stage of the bike journey it just didn't work out so my visa was expiring before I, I was nowhere near Bukatingi and my 30-day visa was expiring and I, my plan if I needed to extend my visa was to go to the immigration office in Bukatingi but I was just so far away from Bukatingi I wasn't even going to make it so I went to a city called Pekinbaru which is very near to Dumai as the crow flies and I went there and extended my tourist visa for another 30 days but I still couldn't ride my bike my knees wouldn't let me and I rested up there for a week or two weeks I can't remember how long and then I finally got on the bike again and I rode for one day and my knees blew out again just from one day of riding and I found myself in this small town on the highway system and I ended up staying there I think for two weeks or more than two weeks just in that one town again resting my knees and then I finally I mean my visa was expiring again like I had a 30-day visa then a 30-day visa extension and because of my knees I just hadn't covered any ground at all and my visa extension was already expiring so now I had no choice I either had to turn around get back to do my get on the ferry and just come back to Malaysia with my tail between my legs you know complete failure or I would have to get all the way to Bukatingi and um, there I would um, like fly out of uh, Indonesia and then you know continue from there and that's what I ended up doing my knees suddenly got better I changed my footwear and I did some things about foot placement on the pedals and that seemed to, to help a lot and then I was able to actually ride my bike every day long like six seven hours a day riding my bike you know uphill the entire time really steep climbs and I was fine my knees were fine everything was back to normal so I was really happy about that and then I got to a Bukatingi and then yeah so that's sort of what happened last time and then well of course on my rides there I discovered how brutal the conditions were for cycling the road were so narrow um, really steep like once you got into the mountains if you wanted to go touring like ride your bike out to tourist destinations look at beautiful things other cities I mean you really couldn't do it on a bicycle not realistically because the roads were just way too steep and there was so much heavy traffic on those highway systems on all the roads the truck traffic was unbelievable it was just overwhelming and it really made no sense at all I mean you could tough it out and you could do it and you know you could play the odds that you're gonna ride your bike all the way through Sumatra and you're basically rolling the dice on whether you're going to be flattened by one of these trucks or not and luckily I, I was not flattened came close a couple of times and but it's just not a comfortable experience it's no fun at all and you feel like you're bothering people all the time because you've got all these Indonesian drivers in trucks and cars and now they're they're facing the same situation I am they have the highway is narrow it's crowded it's curving it's going straight up so they're having to deal with all that and now they see some dumb foreigner on a bicycle taking up half their lane and now they have to get around me right so I felt like I was just annoying people all the time and then at the end of my time there I didn't use the bicycle at all for like any kind of distance I rode it a lot around Bukatingi around the countryside I, I, I love having a bicycle but it was not a good way of exploring the area the distances were too great the roads were too crowded congested too steep too narrow and they heat of course was, was off the charts uh, much of the time so then I rented a scooter and then the last month and a half that I was there something like that I had a scooter and that made my life so much better 
I was able just to zoom around to all these places I wanted to visit, go up and down the coast, see a lot of beautiful areas, have a lot of fun, and um, yeah, had a really good time. So that was the way I should have done it from the beginning. And in terms of all the expenses that the bicycle brought into my life, uh, <laughs> I was actually in a pre maybe the two behind the scenes videos ago, I was talking about how everything I've ever done in my life, like every decision I've ever made, looking back was a mistake. It's just, that's the way my life has gone or my brain, that's how it works. I always see what I did wrong, never what I did right. And in this case, looking back, now that all the dust is settled on that experience, it would have been so much better to, I could have gone there by ferry. I love taking ferries. Boats are so much better than airplanes. But I could have landed, you know, in Dumai by ferry, taken a bus from there to Bukatingi, and in Bukatingi, purchased a scooter. So what I should have done was just bought a scooter and then used it for all the time that I wanted to use it. And then when my trip is over, um, sell it, give it away, whatever I want to do with it. I never considered doing that because as a foreigner on a tourist visa, legally you can't do that. You can't actually buy a motorcycle or a scooter and, and register it in your name. It's not legal. So it seemed like ah, that would be really complicated to do. But what you could do, you could make an arrangement with a local person that, you know, just buy it from them, give them the full purchase price, but they would have to agree to leave it registered in their name. And then you have, you know, then you're legal, you've got a license plate and you've got insurance in their name, all those things. So I think I, I, think I could have worked it out. I think before I go to any kind of country, from a distance, all these things look very, very complicated and very daunting. And it turns out you just need to get to know local people. And as soon as you get to make some contacts with local people, you know, suddenly everything becomes really simple. And because I stayed there long enough that I got to know some, some people, they made everything so much easier for me. And that's how I was able to rent a scooter and store my bicycle and have a place to stay and I had so many good experiences. But yeah, you have to get to know uh, local people to, uh, to, to be able to do a lot of these things, like, you know, buy a scooter. You know, you show up in a, in a foreign land and it's like, okay, I want to buy a scooter. Well, how? Like, where do you start, right? And um, yeah, but if you know someone local, they can really help out with stuff like that. So that's what I should have done. And uh, bought a scooter, used it, sold it. You can't, you know, you can't sell it for the same amount that you bought it for, but, you know, the, the, the amount of money that I would have lost would have been far less than the expenses I incurred because I had the bicycle with me. So, and on top of all that, the videos that I shot, I don't know, they're not really that interesting. To me, they're fascinating because they're my experiences, but riding the bicycle, using my 360 camera. I did that at the beginning. I shot 360 video and I tried to get fancy with it, mounting the camera in different places around the bike to get an overhead shot, a shot from the front, a shot from behind, you know, a shot from the side, and then mixing it all together with music and everything you can do with a 360 camera. And then mounting a GoPro on a chest harness and on the handlebars and getting different angles, different points of view. That's a lot of fun to do, but it takes a tremendous amount of time. And then editing and uploading the videos is, takes a tremendous amount of time. And then in the end, the videos are not really that interesting to a wide audience. They may have an interest to a very niche audience of people who'd like to ride bicycles, but there are very few people in the world that fit into that category. So that's another reason, you know, riding a bike and shooting video at the same time is, is not ideal. Though there is one advantage to it. I said that it helps a lot when you get to know local people. But the, the funny thing is that having a bicycle and going on a bike tour actually helps you meet local people because it's a, it's a conversation piece. So the, the people that I did get to know in um, Sumatra and who became friends of mine, I met all of them 
because I had the bicycle. You know, they see you riding by and that you're doing something unusual, doing something interesting, and then people come up to talk to you, say, oh, well, how, how far do you ride in a day and where are you from and where are you going? And somehow that bicycle acts as a bridge between you and other people. Whereas if you're just, you know, going around by bus, flying in, flying out, you don't have that bridge. I think you have to work a little bit harder maybe. So that, that's one advantage of doing something like a big motorcycle trip or a scooter trip or a bicycle trip, something like that. Anyway, all of that is sort of an aside to talk about that when I, one of my ideas for coming back to Malaysia and why I came to Kuala Lumpur in particular was to transition over from the bike to a backpack because I had my backpack in storage here in Kuala Lumpur and I wanted to come to KL and I, I dismantled my bike. My entire bike has been dismantled and I have it in storage at a friend's house, a friend of mine, Matthew, who lives here in KL. He was kind enough even to come down to Port Dixon and pick me up in his uh, car. He has an SUV with a big luggage area in the back. And I broke my bike down as small as I could get it. You know, you remove the wheels, remove the handlebars, the pedals, take everything off the bike, pack it, wrap it up in garbage bags, you know, so it's waterproof and you don't get grease and dirt everywhere. And I just threw that in the back of his SUV and we put it in storage um, at, at his house. So my bike is out of my life right now. I got my backpack out of storage. Another friend of mine, Daryl, he was storing my backpack while I was in Sumatra. So I got my backpack and now, so I'm basically transitioning from a cyclist to a guy with just a backpack. And I also spent so much time editing videos from Sumatra, much, it took so long. I, my brain and my fingers must be very slow or something, or I shoot too much video. Anyway, it took me far longer to edit that video than I expected. So once again, I have to leave Malaysia because my visa is expiring. I've used up my entire um, tourist visa. And now I have to get out again very soon. And I had certain ideas about going somewhere. Um, I had thoughts about going to Bangladesh about going to Vietnam, and I, I still have those thoughts, but the way my life is right now, a big change like that doesn't really fit in. I just need something easy, fast, and simple, basically, as I switch over from, um, you know, using a backpack, and um, I don't have a lot of time, and I kind of just want to go somewhere for Christmas you know, for the, the holiday period. So what I decided to do kind of last minute, again, perhaps poor planning on my part, because even when I started looking into like going to Bangladesh for a month and riding up and down the rivers on the launches there, doing something like that. But then I started looking into the visas. And I remember when I went to Bangladesh my first time, I had a lot of trouble with my tourist visa. Um, but it's, it's, it's complicated to go to Bangladesh. And I was looking at the requirements online right now and they was talking about, oh, now you need a letter of invitation from someone in Bangladesh. And yeah, I would have to go to the embassy here in KL, the high commission. And they say it's gonna take, you know, five to seven business days to process. And, and again, this letter of invitation. And I know from experience, when I, I had a visa on arrival last time for Bangladesh and they gave me a lot of trouble at the airport over it. They didn't want to give me a visa on arrival, even though I had all the proper paperwork, but they held me overnight at the immigration office in, uh, in Dhaka. They, they wouldn't let me go, like immigration wouldn't stamp me into the country. They held me there overnight because I had to do an interview with the head of immigration the next day and they and this woman the head of immigration she didn't come in until like 10 a.m so they basically kept me at the airport overnight i forget what time i landed 10 uh it was in the evening 8 9 10 in the evening and a friend of mine had come to the airport to meet me they were going to pick me up at the airport we pre-arranged this and they knew when my flight was landing but then i had to contact my friend and just tell them I, you know, they're not letting me into the country so that was a big complicated mess too. 
And uh, yeah, I was on, I remember I had a lot of trouble contacting them because I didn't have a um, SIM card. Uh, had to get, I can't remember how I dealt with all those problems, but my poor friend was out there waiting for me and hours going by and I couldn't get out of the airport. And in the end, after I did my interview with the head of immigration, they said they would let me into the country, um, but only for 20 days. Because, you know, the visa on arrival is 30 days, but for some reason they decided only to give me 20 days, but they did let me into the country. So Bangladesh is pretty serious about letting foreigners in. And once I read that I had to get a letter of invitation and uh, yeah, I, I thought, yeah, oh, and I didn't have enough time left either. If I really wanted, th this idea to go to Bangladesh is like a brand new idea. It just came out of nowhere because I was watching the videos from Bald and Bankrupt when he was in Bangladesh. And then I went back and watched my own videos from Bangladesh and uh, it kind of made me think, yeah, it'd be a lot of fun to go back there because I really wanted to ride on the launches more. The last time I went, I spent my entire time just in Dhaka and I, I didn't travel around the country at all. And I thought I'd, it'd be a lot of fun to go back there and hop on the, the boats, like on the river system, and just travel all around you know, by, uh, by river boat. But that idea came out of nowhere, and it's too late in terms. I, I can't get organized for Bangladesh in time. You know, I won't, there's a risk that I won't be able to get the visa. So, um, you know, booking a flight. That, that's always the catch-22 when it comes to these sorts of things, because in order to get the visa, you have to supply all the documents. Like you have to have a ticket in and out of the country. Now this letter of invitation, you have to have confirmed hotel reservations for when you land. So you have to have all that first before you can even apply for the visa. And then if you don't get the visa or you don't get it in time, then you've lost all of that money for the flight and stuff like that. So it's a real catch-22. You've got you to ease into these things, you know, as carefully as possible. And uh, so anyway, so I, 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 got, I stopped thinking about that. And my other idea was to go to Vietnam. I've been to Vietnam, but only one time in my life, and it was so long ago. It, it's like a completely different country today. So it would be interesting to go there again. And because, and there's also a question of budget. I'm like, you know, <laughs> you know, if the bank account was, uh, could support it, then things would be a lot easier. You know, I'd just pick a country and say, oh, I'm going to fly there and I'll go there. But I have to pick places that are the least expensive for, for a little trip like this. So I'm looking at places that are close. You know, Bangladesh was even already getting a bit far, but there are inexpensive flights to Vietnam. So I was thinking about doing that. And I was kind of assuming all along that's what I would do. But then it, that didn't really work out either for logistical reasons. But also Vietnam now offers a 90-day tourist visa, which is amazing. So if I go, if and when I go to Vietnam, I want to be in a position where I can take full advantage of that entire 90 days. But right now I'm not thinking of that. What I really want to do is basically spend a month somewhere, you know, over the holidays because I do want to come back to Malaysia and then finalize all of this, you know, getting rid of my bicycle. And I, I have things to do here in Kuala Lumpur that I haven't managed to get done yet. So I'm still sort of in the middle of a bunch of stuff and I don't really want to be gone for 90 days, right? So. Yeah. And you don't really want to go in and out of a country a lot um, unless, you know, you're getting good value out of out of those trips. Like I wouldn't want, like right now, I wouldn't want to go to Vietnam, stay, you know, they give me 90 days and I stay only for one week and then go somewhere else. It feels like I've wasted one of my visa shots, right? And uh, I don't know what's involved in getting this 90-day visa, but I'm sure there's paperwork and you've got to fill out forms and it's going to take time. But anyway, so I suddenly I made the snap decision to go back to Sumatra. And what I did yesterday, I booked a flight to Madan. 
and uh, I've been to Madan before. I've flown into Madan before. I've flown out of Madan, but I'm, I'm developing a plan to um, kind of make the trip as, as interesting as possible. I mean, what I want to do, of course, I want to go to Lake Toba. I've been to Lake Toba before, but only on the on one side of it. I spent a lot of time sort of on this side of Lake Toba. I had my bicycle there at the time and I rode around that part of the lake. I stayed in some of the small towns alongside the lake and I stayed in uh, Tuk Tuk on the island of Samosir. But I didn't see any of the other side. So I, didn't, I never went all the way around the lake and there's quite a beautiful mountainous area on the other side of Lake Toba that I never visited. So I'm thinking about, like if I go to Lake Toba, I can make it a new experience, different from what I've done before. And I was thinking about traveling in, in, in a special way. Um, I haven't quite worked out the details yet, but um, with my backpack, you know, I'm a lot, I have a lot more freedom in terms of what I can do as opposed to having a bicycle. And uh, yeah, we'll see. So I'm thinking even of going to like Madan, Lake Toba, and then perhaps going up to Banda Aceh. And when I was, into ba I was in Banda Aceh before, I rode my bicycle up to Banda Aceh one time, but I didn't spend a lot of time there. My visa was expiring again. I get, that's the problem with riding a bike. You're, you're, it takes so long to do anything and your visa is just constantly expiring. So um, I wanted to visit places around Banda Aceh. They have the uh, Tsunami Museum, for example, but I never had time to visit it. And there are the offshore islands where like foreign tourists go, Pulau We. Um, for so, you know, when I was there before, I, I didn't have the time and I didn't really have the interest. My brain wasn't in the mindset of going to beautiful beaches and tropical islands. That wasn't the kind of the trip that I was on, but just for interest's sake, and uh, perhaps for a YouTube audience, going to places like Pula Hue would be interesting. So anyway, I have all these thoughts and I've already booked a flight. So I booked my flight to Madan. And then uh, one of the reasons I decided to do this was, yeah, it's inexpensive. It's like one of the cheaper things I can do in terms of going to another country. But also Indonesia, you can get a visa on arrival for 30 days and you can get that at the airport. And uh, so, yeah, I could just land in Medan. They've got a window there. You go up to the window and you pay your 500,000 uh, rupiah and uh, they give you a receipt and a, uh, I think you just get the receipt at that point, or maybe the receipt and the sticker. No, just the receipt, I think. And then you get into the immigration lineup and the immigration officer asks you their questions and then takes the receipt. And if they let you into the country, you know, they print out this sticker, the visa on arrival for 30 days, and it goes into your passport. However, anyway, that's what I was planning on doing. But then I remembered that Indonesia just recently introduced an e-visa, an e-visa on arrival. And it, given a choice, I would still just get it at the airport. You know, once you go online and start trying to do things through a website, it can be complicated. Payment can be complicated. Who knows how long it would take to get the e-visa? I was looking at some websites online and everybody was saying it can take between five and 14 days to you know, process it. And I was like, oh, I can't wait that long. You know, uh, the clock is uh, ticking. So I was thinking I wasn't going to do it, but then I, I, in all the research, there's one big advantage to the e-visa. And as if you get an e-visa on arrival, if you end up staying longer and you want to extend it for another 30 days, you can do it online. And once I read that, it was like, whoa, okay, that is huge. Because a big problem for me on my recent trips to the Bukatingi area was you know, going to immigration to apply for the 30-day visa on arrival extension. That process got got me in so much trouble. When I did it in Bukatingi the first time, that's that whole horrendous story where out of nowhere, they said I needed to get a sponsor, a local sponsor for this, you know, visa on arrival extension. 
and that that made things so much more complicated and, and there's a whole bunch of holidays in there and it ended up taking something like two weeks to get a 30-day extension and it was, it was just a horrible experience and then when I did it in Padang it was a lot easier I didn't have to get a sponsor but you're still looking at several trips to the immigration office spread out over a longer you know relatively long period of time and it could if you're unlucky yeah it could take 10 days before they do all of that and it's a lot of work but if you can do it online then I, I don't know how that works to be honest I guess I'll find out if I decide to extend it but you have your you know visa on arrival your e-visa and then apparently you can just do it from your phone like I don't know what that means maybe you still have to go to an immigration office to finalize it like how do you get a stamp in your passport um, like maybe you can extend it online then you get a, a download to show that you have it but then you have to go to the immigration office and give them you know a, a printout and your passport and then they stamp it that makes the most sense to me it's unlikely that you can just wander around the country on your own and oh I'm gonna extend my visa oh, I extended it and then you're done because your passport hasn't been involved there's no physical stamp in your passport yet and you haven't communicated with a local immigration office in the region of Indonesia where you are and that's quite important in, in Indonesia. They like to know where foreigners are and keep track of them. So I think it'll be, but it should be easier. You can extend it online, and then I think maybe you have to make one trip to immigration as opposed to a thousand trips to immigration, and maybe it will go a lot faster. Anyway, so I decided to apply for the e-visa. <laughs> so... Last night, you know, I was, on, I was online and I was reading all of these websites, people who have got, done the process and give you all the advice. And it's a relatively new thing. So people who did it originally, you know, the first people to try to get this e-visa, they all ran into problems. The biggest problem seems to be that payment was declined. They had a lot of trouble charging the 500,000 ringgit or ringgit, 500,000 rupiah to their credit card it just payment denied payment denied and then they were just unable to fight through the system and there's you know if you go to one of these websites with all the instructions go down to the comments and you'll probably find a hundred horror stories of things that went wrong like so many different things went wrong not just the payment problem but uh, many many other problems and it, uh, did, it didn't sound like a very smooth process but it's been a while now. I think the, the system has been in place for over a year now, maybe a year and a half. So maybe they, I thought maybe they smoothed out the, uh, the bugs. So I thought, okay, let's, let's try to do this. And um, I decided not to do it last night because I was so tired. I was exhausted last night. And it's okay, let's get a good night's sleep. We'll wake up in the morning rested make a cup of coffee, you know, get all my documents ready, all the things I think I'm going to need because you have to upload things and fill out things and then you got to make a payment to your credit card. And um, I thought, okay, let's do this first thing in the morning when I'm really fresh and really take my time. And man, oh man, oh man, am I glad I did that because had I tried to do this last night, I, I, I would have given up. I would have just been tearing out my hair because everything went wrong. It was one of the most complicated, confusing, stressful, and frustrating things I've ever done online. And that, that is saying something because everything online is, is a nightmare for me. At this point, my brain is still spinning. Um, I can jump to the end and say that I was successful. So I was able to open an account. I remembered at the last minute, I think people were giving the advice that if you think maybe you're going to want to extend your visa on arrival while you're there, your e-visa on arrival, if you think you might want to do it, then it's better to open an account with 
immigration, like Indonesian immigration. There's a website or something called Molina. And you have to go to Molina. People were so clear about that. They said that there's all these websites out there that are fake, that are trying to sucker you in to applying for the e-visa through their website, but they're not legitimate. Um, they're like visa processing agents or something. And there's a lot of warnings that they're stealing your identity. They'll take your money, but you won't get a visa or the visa won't be valid. So everyone's saying, go to Molina, the official Indonesian website. Don't go anywhere else. And I'm very lucky that I did that. But anyway, you go to Molina and then they say, what you should do is open your own account. So then you get, you know, open an account with your email address and password and now you have an account. And then once you have that account, when you apply for the e-visa, it will be listed in your profile. And then while you're in Indonesia, you can go into your account, go to your profile and see your active visa, and then you can extend it from there. But if you don't have an account, then it's more complicated or not even possible to do. Anyway, at the last minute I remembered that because the first time I did it, I forgot about the account business. Um, I guess I was uh, moving too fast and I just went to Molina and then I started going through the process where it just says, you know, apply for an e-visa. So, you know, I was going through the stages one by one by one. And one thing you have to do is take a picture or you have to upload a copy of your the data page from your passport and they have very detailed instructions on what's good and bad they show all these examples about how your photo how your scan is supposed to look and they'll show the bad version and with a big x through it and then they show you the good version another one another one another one all the things that you're not supposed to do and one thing about modern passports, the Canadian passport has so many security measures built into the paper, it's highly reflective. It, it's got all kinds of um, holograms built into the page. They're all security features. And if you have light shining on your passport page, it's like a brilliant rainbow of colors. And if you try to take a picture of that, you can't see any of the information. So I was here in this room, I was trying so many things closing the curtains, building shades, putting my passport here, and you're trying to angle your camera, you know, it's like, ah, here's a reflection, there's a reflection, and, and sometimes the reflection would cover up your name, the rest of it would be legible, but they can't read your name, and then you get your name legible, but now your passport number is covered up by this colorful hologram reflection. And it was so hard to do, it took a long time. But I finally took a photo that I thought was um, suitable. I was like, oh yeah, everything's, you know, it's okay. And, and then you have to crop it very, very carefully. They have precise requirements. You can't just, you know, take it, you can't hold your passport in your hand and take a picture and upload that. It has to be cropped and framed in exactly the right way. Everything was fine. So I did that and then I had it saved to my phone and then on the proper page, I uploaded the picture of my um, passport and I was so happy to see that it was accepted and showed up in the little square. And then you have to upload a photo of yourself, like an actual passport style photo. So I went through that process as well, you know, I uploaded that. And then you have to fill out all the rest of the information, you know, the full name and, where you're going to be staying in Indonesia, the name of your hotel. The postcode of that hotel is really important. A lot of people online said they had trouble with that because the post, postal code wouldn't be accepted. The numbers, the, like their hotel would have six numbers in their postal code, but it wouldn't be accepted by the system. You know how all that works. Um, <laughs> mine, was, was, mine didn't work for a long time. You know, I picked out a hotel and then you have all these boxes and the very first box says address. And then underneath that, it says postal code and then state, province, region, district, you know. And when you put in your postal code, if it's a proper one, everything else gets populated. So once you put in the postal code, then state, province, region, district, all that stuff is automatically filled out, which is a good thing because I would have no idea how to fill that out. But nowhere in any of the boxes 
did it ask for the name of the hotel? It said address, then postal code. And I thought, ah, what do I do here? What do I do here? I thought, surely they need to know the name of the hotel, right? So I put in the name of the hotel, and then I wrote out the street address, right? Because nowhere else in there did it ask for the street address. It just says postal code. And I thought, well, this box says address. I thought, well, okay, I put in the name and then the street address and the street number, you know, all the details that you see on Google Maps or on Agoda. I made sure all the information was right. And then I just kept getting error messages every time I tried to submit it. Error, 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 error. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I thought, okay, maybe the name of the hotel is not technically an address. So maybe that's what it doesn't like. Because it doesn't tell you what's wrong. It just tells you it's wrong. So I removed the name of the hotel and I just had the street address, street number and address. And that was rejected again and again and again. And I thought, well, try a different hotel, you know, a different address. Nope, rejected, rejected, rejected. So finally I thought, well, maybe just the name. So I put in the name of the hotel and no address at all. And that was accepted. It's like, oh, for Pete's sake. So why does it say address? It should just say name, like hotel name. Anyway, but it doesn't want the address. It actually, it wants the name of the hotel. So finally I got all that filled out. All, everything was accepted. And then I would got to the next stage, you know, submit. And it was rejected again. And then I have to scan through the whole page. And it turns out my passport page wasn't accepted. When I initially uploaded it, it was accepted and was inserted. But then at the next stage, it was rejected. It says, you know, not good. But they don't tell you what's not good about it. As far as I could tell, it was perfect. You know, it was perfectly legible. It was clear. It was framed properly. It was in focus. Everything about it was perfect. But um, it said, no, we, we can't uh, process this. So now I'm back in this room, you know, like a mad photographic scientist uh, opening the curtains to let sunlight in. I take another picture that was a bit brighter and this and that. I upload it. It's accepted. It populates the screen, but then you get down to submit and then it's rejected again. Nope, not good enough. So I went back around and around and around and around. And I don't know why, but eventually I took a photograph of my passport and then it said, thank you very much. We accepted it. It works. And then you get another page. What they do is they have a computer system that scans all the information on your passport and then inserts it automatically. So, you know, your name and expiry date, issue date, all those things, your date of birth, they take it from the photograph, which is why it has to be high quality. But then, of course, you have to go through it all because it made a ton of mistakes. It had, you know, the issue date for my passport, but it was incorrect. I don't know why it would be, but they had the wrong date. So I had to make sure everything was, uh, was correct. And so there it was. And then it said, then I, I submitted it. You know, of course you have to have your local phone number, you know, a lot of information they require. And all of that was filled out. And then I got to the next page and it said, okay, please review everything to make sure everything is accurate. And then they have a long checklist every single piece of information that you entered throughout this long process is listed there with a checkbox beside it. So you're supposed to confirm that it's accurate line by line by line, every single piece of information you have to confirm. So I went, yes, 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 yes. I scanned it, got all the way down to the bottom. And then there is the final submit. And then you would then pay for it, right? So I got all the way down to the bottom and, you know, check OK if everything is accurate. And then I said, OK. And my application went into the system with no option to pay. Nothing. No payment screen came up. There was no option to pay. At the very top of this, all these screens, they have three big lines that tell you the steps. Step one is apply. Step two is pay. Step three is download your e-visa. And I was always, you know, these buttons at the top, you think they're clickable, 
you think, oh, well, you click on the apply button, and then when that's done, you click on the pay button. But no, these are just a summary of the stages you've completed. So once you've submitted your application successfully, you get a big green checkbox on apply. And then underneath it is pay. And when you're done with payment, you'll get a checkbox there as well. So you can't click on any of these. And then after, like I said, after I went through the entire application process, I clicked on, okay, everything is fine. I've confirmed it. And then my application was submitted and that's it. There was no option to pay. And they give you this batch number because I guess you can submit many applications at the same time. And they give you a batch number to track down the status of your application. So I found my batch number because I had to go back to the Molina website and try to figure out like what happened to my application. I know I have to pay for this thing, but you guys never asked for payment. What am I supposed to do now? This never came up in all the information. So I went to there and I put in my batch number and then there, there, there was my application with all the status. And then there was a line on the application saying waiting for payment. Like, well, yeah, I want to pay, but you never asked me for any money. You, took, you submitted my application, but you never gave me the option to pay. So now I'm thinking, how do I go back? And I'm looking at that thing and there was nothing to click on. Like it says, you know, waiting for payment. You can click on that as long as you want. There's a button there, nothing happens. There's no reaction going around and around and around and around. And there was no way for me to pay. I had submitted my application for a visa on arrival, an e-visa, successfully. It's still in the system now, but I didn't pay for it. I didn't get any emails prompting me to pay for it. There's nothing on the website that allows me to pay for it. And basically, I was stuck. I just ran into a dead end. There's nothing I could do from that point. And I thought, oh, well, that's the end of that. I guess I'll, you know, it's not a, not a deal breaker because I can just go to Madan, land at the airport, and I can do it in person, which is what I was planning on doing anyway. So I thought, oh, well, that's how things are on Planet Doug. These things just generally don't work. But then I started thinking about the advantage. Then, well, then I remembered the account business. And I thought, ah, oh, you know, maybe I can try again because all the people giving advice online one of the number one questions they got was from people just like me who were unable to pay. And they says, okay, I've submitted my application, but I can't pay for it. What do I do now? And all these experts were saying, don't worry about it. Just forget about that and reapply. Like you can apply as many times as you want. And if you already have an application in the system, you can put in a second application. Just try again and it'll be fine. And that first application will just be inert, like nothing will happen to it. So I thought, okay, so maybe what I can do is just try again. And I remembered this account business. So then I went all the way back to the beginning to open an account. I was a little bit worried about this because I had a, a memory of at some point in the past creating some kind of an account with immigration. I don't know whether, I don't know when this might have happened or why I might have done it or whether it was the same sort of thing. I wasn't sure. So I thought maybe I already have one. And if I try to create a new one and I get a duplicate identity or something, you know, who knows, I could just blow up the entire internet. So I thought, well, let's just try this. And I have a normal email address that I, I use as, you know, my username. If you ever open an account online with anything, you need an email address, right? And I have an email account that I use most of the time for these things. And I thought, well, I'll put it in. And then if it is accepted, you know, and it says, oh, you know, this email address has never been used before, then, oh, okay, then I can just go ahead with the system. So I, I started the process of opening an account and I put in my email address and I got a happy message that says, ah, this, uh, this is a usable email address. Good to go. So you have to put it in two times, right? Of course, to confirm it, you have to you know, um, create a password and fill out all the other information. And I hit submit and then I got an error message that said this email address is unusable. 
So I thought, well, why? Like, they don't tell you. You know, AIs, computers are supposed to be so smart, but they're, they're like, what are they like? They're like a real disapproving uh, teacher or principal can tell you that they're unhappy. You know, you failed, but they won't tell you what you did wrong, right? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, this computer says, ah, this email address isn't going to work for me. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with it? Like, does it mean it's already in your system? You don't accept it because of the structure of it or this email provider, you don't like them. They're not, who knows? But anyway, I decided to just do it again, but use a different email address, a more established one. You know, I don't like to use it for these sorts of things because it's more of a foundational kind of email address for my life. But I thought, well, let me use this one. So I went into the system and all over again, you know, creating a new account using this email address. And you have to, when you're creating an account, you have to do all the same things that you do for the e, the e visa. I had to upload my passport photo, you know, profile photo, all of that information. Um, I have to do it again. Luckily, I have copies now that worked for the original application, the one that just vanished that I wasn't able to pay for. So now for my account, I use the same passport photo, the same, um, same everything, and everything uploaded fine. And now I had an account with all this information embedded in it. And then from inside that account, I could now redo the entire e-visa application. And this has been my whole morning. I had been working on this for hours. This is just like I was exhausted by this point and I was starting all over again from the beginning. So I go through the whole process applying for the e-visa and it was exactly the same as the previous one. Every page was the same. And then I also had to double check all the information. You, know, you do go through all the uh, check boxes, fine. So I went through all the check boxes I got down to the bottom where it said the button, okay, everything looks good to me. That's what I did before and I never got an option to pay. So this time I thought, okay, I must have made a mistake at this stage. I must have missed a step. I must have missed a button. But I went over that page from top to bottom, left to right. I looked at it from every possible angle. I examined it. I was Sherlock Holmes on the case, looking for any possible way that, like there's nothing, there was only one active button on the screen at that time to confirm that everything is correct. That's the only button available to me. There was nothing else I could click on. So I had no choice. And the last time I did it, it didn't work. So I thought, well, it's, I don't, this is all I can do. So I clicked on that button to confirm that everything is accurate. And then I got a payment page. The first time I did exactly the same thing and no payment page showed up. This time I got a payment page. So I'd moved on to the second check mark. Ah, yes, this was good. So now I'm going through the payment thing. You got to fill in your you know, credit card number and information and codes and expiry dates, all that information. But now you're introducing a third party, my bank in Canada. And they do so many weird things. It just drives me insane. Sometimes they do things, sometimes they don't. And in this case, I finally clicked on, okay, pay now. And then I got a window from my bank that said, in order to complete this transaction, we need to send you a code to confirm that it's you. And we can do this one of two ways. We can phone you at your phone number in Canada. So that's not going to work for me. But they gave me the option of using an email address that I have online with my bank. We can send the code to this email address that goes through one of my old websites. It's a very complicated roundabout thing. And I can use that email for my bank because it's a paid service. Because I pay for my website, I pay for hosting, and I created an email account for that. So my bank will accept that 
they'll send codes to that email address, but they won't send it to a Microsoft account or a Google account like Gmail or Yahoo or Microsoft. None of the free services, they won't use those. But I happen to have a paid email address for an old website, and that's what my bank uses. And they says, okay, we've sent you the code to this email address. Go get the code, come back to this screen, insert it. I have two phones going on at the same time. I've got one phone with my visa application. And so now I've got a window there from my bank waiting for me to insert the code. And on my other phone, to my amazement, I got an email like instantly, boop, there's my code, my verification code, yes. So I get the code, a six, a six number code, right? Da, 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 da. And this took like 30 seconds at the most to do this. And I went, okay, I got the number. I went back to my other phone the entry window was gone. Not only was like, the, where I was supposed to insert the code from my bank, it wasn't there anymore. Not only was that window completely gone, I had been logged out of my immigration account. For whatever reason, I'd been kicked out of the entire system. So my entire application was gone, completely crashed. The payment window was gone. I was no longer in my account and everything I had done up to that point had just vanished. And uh, I hadn't touched the phone. Like I said, I had two phones going on. This one was just sitting down there. This one I was getting, you know, I was getting the code on this one. I got the code, looked over here and I was back at the home page of immigration, but not inside my account. I had just been completely, I had been logged out of my account and all the payment information and all the application information had just vanished. It's just such a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Um, but the weird thing is, even though nothing had happened, I hadn't inserted the code, I got another email from my bank saying that $2 had been charged to my credit card because like immigration had to verify that my card was real. And what they do is um, like they charge you $2 and then they re reimburse you $2. And if that transaction works, then it proves to them that that is a valid credit card. So they had done that even though everything had crashed, I hadn't even managed to finalize any of the payment because I needed the security code. None of that had been completed. And yet Indonesian immigration said somehow deposited, you know, charged $2 to my credit card and then reimbursed me already for $2. So they confirmed my card, even though the entire application process had completely um, fallen apart. So I had no idea what was going on. So I had to start all over, all the way from the beginning again. But this time I had an account at least. So I logged in to my account. I went looking for anything, like did I have an active application? Was anything going on? There was nothing there for me to do. There was no active, no batch number, no ID number, nothing at all. It was just a completely blank, fresh account. So there's nothing I could do. I just started all over from the beginning, went through all the steps that I just described, got to the payment part, clicked on, you know, payment, pay now. I got the window from my bank saying, we just emailed you a verification code. So I, and this time it took a long time. Um, the first time it was like instantaneous. This time I was holding my phone and just sort of staring at the window where I have to put in the code because if it's gonna disappear again, I want to see it happen. So I'm staring at it, staring at it, staring at it. And I've got my other phone open, you know, waiting for the email waiting, 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 you know, <laughs> I'm going back and forth between them. Come on, come on, come on, you know. And I don't know how many minutes it was, but it was getting into the minutes, three, four minutes maybe. And then beep, I got an email from my bank. I had the code, memorized the code, and then I was able to put it in. Amazing. I hit confirm and payment went through. Finally, 
after I don't I can't tell you how many hours this had been this it took up my entire day basically and now I just had to wait because I successfully submitted an application I had successfully paid but I didn't have any information about how long it was going to take a lot of these websites said five days nine days 14 days and so there was a chance that my visa application would be approved but it would be too late and I'd already be in Sumatra so I, I wouldn't lose anything other than money because if it doesn't get approved in time I can still just fly to Madan and apply for the visa on arrival in person and then pay a second time in cash so I was just thinking that it's like oh man I hope this doesn't take a long time and before I'd even thought I hope this doesn't take a long time I got an email from immigration that said your application had been approved so it took I think seconds like less than one minute from successfully paying to getting the email that my application had been approved so that worked out well but then I open up the email and there's the email and it said ah your application for an e-visa on arrival has been approved so click on this button to download the PDF you know you have to download the visa and then you show that to immigration when you get to Indonesia so there's a big button you know download your e-visa so I thought amazing this is amazing I click on download it flips me over to the immigration the Indonesian immigration website and again I'm kicked out of my account kicked right out of it I'm back at the main home page for Indonesian immigration and it's just sitting there. I clicked on the, you know, download and it says, you know, this will take you to Indonesian immigration website and there you download your e-visa. So I clicked on the button, took me over to immigration and I was just looking at the home page, kicked out of my account again and there was obviously no button to download. So I just logged into my account again, you know, name, password, all that stuff, thinking there must be a download button there. I got into my account. There was no download button. There was like no, I saw that there was a, a, a sign there, you know, my whole, the batch number and the application number and, you know, e-visa. And it said at the end, approved, like payment confirmed and approved, you know, big check mark but there was nothing there to actually download the PDF so I was stuck again so I went back to my email and uh, you know I closed my email account opened it up again went to that email and it was the same email it's not they didn't send me a new one the same one that said you've been approved click on this button to download your visa I click on the button the link it's a link took me to immigration and I was kicked out of my account again and there was nothing there there was no way for me to download the visa it's just like come on like does does nothing work how does the world keep going how does anything how are banks working how are airlines operational how does anything work when <clears throat> these websites these online accounts are so filled with glitches and problems and and errors right so I thought now what am I going to do I have a visa I've paid for it it's been confirmed but I can't get it I cannot get a physical copy of it so I'm thinking now what uh, am I going to have to email Indonesian immigration and get into a long back and forth but then I went back to the email that they sent me and I just started reading it from top to bottom the top half was English I think the bottom half was in Indonesian so I read through all the English I looked through all the Indonesian I scrolled all the way down to the bottom and at the bottom of the email there was an attachment my visa was there as an attachment with a normal down so I could download my visa directly from the email it was included as an attachment there was no need to click on the link to go to the website to download it it was inside the email itself so I just hit that little you know the little arrow button with a line underneath it and boom it popped onto my phone 
and it looks very official, looks very real. And at long last, after hours of work, um, unbelievable amount of, of frustration and, and working through the system, so many attempts at getting it done, but I was finally successful. And I have an e-visa for Indonesia for 30 days. <laughs> so anyway, that, that, that has been my morning up until now. I've been a bit busy lately, busier than uh, before, so I haven't watched a whole lot of uh, my usual travel vlogs, travel videos on YouTube. But the one that I did watch that was quite interesting and that I wanted to talk about this morning is the newest video from Bald and Bankrupt. Because in previous behind the scenes videos, I was talking about his videos from Bangladesh and his videos from the uh, Darien Gap because he was in the middle of this project where he wanted to travel with the uh, migrants from Venezuela all the way up to the US border. So he's sort of doing this as, a, as an experience and as a YouTube project where he wants to go with the migrants and that would involve uh, crossing a bunch of borders illegally, walking, and then walking through the Darien Gap from Colombia to Panama and he's posted videos about that already and his video ended with him being in the immigration detention center in Panama. But that, that's where it ended and that was like two or three weeks ago. So I've been waiting for his next video. Luckily he was traveling with another YouTuber, a guy from Greece called uh, Timmy Carter and Timmy shot video of the exact same experience but his last video went a little bit further and he showed that he and Bald both got put on buses from the immigration center in Panama to the border with Costa Rica. It was like a convoy of at least 20 buses filled with illegal migrants who had crossed the Darien Gap and for whatever reason, I still don't understand this at all, for whatever reason there's a system in place where Whoever comes out of the Darien Gap, like thousands of migrants show up um, daily and then they go through a screening process and then they pay 20 or 40 dollars and then they get put on a bus, as I said, convoys of up to 20 buses at a time every day and these buses drive them all the way through Panama and take them to the border with Costa Rica. And I don't know what happens at that border. I don't know why Costa Rica lets them in and if it does let them in under what conditions like what will get stamped in their passport does nothing is there no formal processing I have no idea so but that's where Timmy Carter's video ended with them in the bus bald and bankrupt's video ended in the immigration detention center and that's it but bald and bankrupt just posted his next video and this one is called Riding Mexico's Deadly Migrant Train, The Beast. And unfortunately, there's no video from Timmy Carter yet. And uh, there might be reasons for that, which uh, I'll talk about in a minute, because Timmy shows a lot more detail, a lot more information. Ball just skips so much activity. You really ha you'd have really no idea what happened. So anyway, I was hoping that his next video would start with them in the immigration detention center and then just pick up where the last video ended and then he would get on the bus go to Costa Rica travel all the way through Central America and I thought the journey would continue in the video but he doesn't show any of that the video starts with him at the border of Mexico and the United no at the border of Nicaragua and Mexico he's standing at a river with Timmy Carter and there's a bunch of these uh, homemade boats, kind of w wooden planks put on top of big truck inner tubes. And it's like a, an, an illegal border crossing. So a lot of people there are ferrying big piles of goods back and forth between Nicaragua and uh, Mexico. And then illegal migrants get on these boats and are ferried across the river into Mexico. 
And that's what Bald and Timmy were there to do. And that's where the video opens. And then the whole video goes back into his old style, where with the Darien Gap, it was just like an endless litany of how dangerous the journey is going to be. We could be killed, we could be robbed, we could be kidnapped, we could be deported, we could be arrested, we could, you know. Over and over and over, he was sort of beating the drum of, of this tr journey he was on and how he was a uh, caminante. You know, he joined the migrants on their journey and all this sort of thing. And he said that we have passed through, he was explaining why we, they can't go through immigration because there was a bridge a little bit up the river and he pointed at the bridge and said, okay, that's the official immigration center there. If you want, if you want to go through immigration, you cross that bridge. But he said, we can't do that because we're in the country illegally. And then he said, we went through all of Central America, going through all the countries of Central America illegally. So now we're in Guatemala illegally we don't have an exit stamp or an entrance stamp from any of these countries, so we have no choice but to enter Mexico illegally on one of these rafts. And that was so disappointing to me. And I also don't know what to believe because most of the things he shows in the video always makes me a little bit suspicious about what he is saying and what he is showing and not showing. Everything seems a little bit curated to make uh, an exciting YouTube video, but it may or may not actually be accurate or even the truth about what is going on. But I mean, yeah, I mean, if he, if he traveled all the way through Central America illegally on foot, why wouldn't he show that on video? I mean, it just makes sense to me um, to show, a show what happened. As a viewer, of course, I'm very interested in, you know, what countries did you go through? Like, what happened when you got to the border with Costa Rica? If you've been illegal this whole time, why did they even let you into Costa Rica? Like, or did you get a, an entry stamp for Costa Rica and then you crossed borders illegally? And how were you traveling? By bus? Did you fly? Were you walking with the caminantes? He doesn't give any information, any details at all. He just magically travels from being held at a immigration detention center in Panama, and the next video he's standing at the river of northern Guatemala about to go across into Mexico, and he doesn't explain anything about what happened in between, which I find incredibly disappointing. And as I said, it also makes me a little bit suspicious about what exactly happened. So that's where the video opened. And then the rest of it was equally uh, dissatisfying to me or unsatisfying. It, um, he didn't really give a lot of information or a lot of detail. And some weird things happened. Most of this time, he was talking about something that they call the beast, um, la bestia, or el bestia. I'm not sure if in Spanish it's the, um, if it's masculine or feminine. But apparently, there was a train, like a freight train, that traveled all the way from, this is how he was sort of describing it, from where he was in southern Mexico, because he just crossed from Guatemala into Mexico. And then there's this train that the migrants use to go from there all the way to the U.S. border. They're freight trains, and the migrants climb on top of the train, because it's not a passenger train, it's just carrying freight. And then they sit on top of the train because they can't afford to buy tickets. And it also bypasses all the immigration checkpoints on the highways. And then they ride on the roof of the train all the way to the U.S. border. And this train got, got a reputation as being very dangerous because people will fall asleep and they fall off the train or they're trying to climb onto the train while it's moving or jump off the train while it's moving and they trip and they fall, they go under the wheels 
And there's no, I don't think there are any statistics out there. I haven't seen any realistic facts and figures about how many people died riding this train or were injured on this train. And there's a lot of talk about it being very dangerous that these migrants are exposed and they get robbed by uh, Mexican government officials or immigration officials or Mexican gangs, or they get kidnapped and held for ransom. They get attacked, they get robbed. All these terrible things happen to them while they ride the train. And the train got the name, The Beast. It's kind of a legendary thing in the, the world of the migrants. And I haven't done a lot of research into The Beast, but I, got, I did a little bit of reading this morning, and I got the impression that this beast existed quite a few years ago, but that exact train and the route it followed doesn't exist anymore. And a lot of the train companies have put in procedures to stop people from doing this. And anyway, while Bald was talking about it, I got the impression that we were talking about one train, like one famous train that everybody rides on to go from the border with Guatemala all the way to the border with the United States. And that, that particular train is known as the Beast. But in reality, what's actually going on is that people take all kinds of different trains. I think even in the days of the Beast, they would still end up taking like five or six or seven different trains. They get on one train, ride it as far as it goes, and wherever it stops, they get off the train, and then they have to find another train to take them further than another train than another train. So now when people are talking about the beast, what they're really talking about is any train at all. So just any migrant taking any train, any distance, and then getting on a different train, the whole train network that migrants can ride on through Mexico, all of those trains are called the beast. So I was really confused about that because, you know, Bald, he seemed to be looking for one train in particular. It's like, where is the beast? Where do I go to get on the beast? He's talking to migrants. He's talking to local Mexican people. He's just trying to find out information. Even online, he was looking for information. Where do I get on the beast? But it turns out that there is no beast anymore. There are just trains and migrants are all over the place in the rail network system of Mexico, and they're just trying to get on any train that they can get on. So there is no specific train called the Beast anymore. So I, I think Bald got a little bit confused about that as well, and his video confused me until I, I figured out what was going on. I, I have no idea what the time scale is for all these things that uh, Bald was doing, along with uh, Timmy Carter. But in this video, it seemed like on their first day of trying to find the beast, they failed. They couldn't find like where it started from. And they did go to some railroad tracks and they found a whole bunch of migrants from various countries, from Venezuela and all kinds of different countries. All these migrants are just waiting beside the railroad tracks and they sleep there at night and they're basically waiting for a train. And everybody's like trying to get information. Nobody knows for sure. Like a train will come in, it'll be a freight train. And everybody jumps up like, can we take this one? Can we take this one? But if it's moving too fast, you know, they can't get on it. And it might, if it stops or goes slowly, then they can try to get on it and climb onto the roof. But they don't know exactly where this train is going. So they're asking questions. Everybody's trying to get information from like train station employees or local people or, someone who may have done this journey before and maybe they know better, but um, they, you know, they might jump on a train and um, it turns out that it's not going anywhere. You know, it goes up and then it stops and then reverses and goes into the train yard. And, you know, there's a lot of confusion about what to do. And then Bald and Timmy were unable to get on a train that first day. And I think most of the migrants, part of the Caminante experience is this waiting. That's what you have to do. Um, you just have to wait for the train, and then if it doesn't come today, well, then you sleep there at night, and you and then you wait until tomorrow, or maybe one comes in the middle of the night. I mean, that's the whole commandante experience. 
but of course Bald and Timmy weren't willing to go that far with their experience. They weren't able to get a, the beast to find the beast the first day, so they just checked into a hotel to spend the night. And they, it was a very cheap hotel, like a very low budget, um, kind of, you know, looking on the videos, yeah, very, the cheapest of the cheapest hotels, kind of dirty and old and broken down, kind of a depressing looking place. But they each got a room in this hotel overnight, and then they were going to start again the next day to try to find the beast. But apparently, uh, Timmy got sick. While they, they checked into the hotel, he was really, really sick to his stomach. And uh, this is Bald's video, of course, so we don't see any of this from Timmy's point of view. But Bald says, yeah, you know, it's time to go to the beast, but we have a problem. Timmy isn't feeling well. And then he took his camera into Timmy's hotel room, and Timmy was lying in bed. Um, he seemed to be moaning. And when Bald came in, Timmy picked up a plastic bag and appeared to be vomiting into the plastic bag and clearly was unable to go anywhere. And I have to say, I, had a, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was staged. That sure, Timmy was sick, and yet the spontaneity of Bald going to his room and opening the door and Timmy just happening to be vomiting at that point, it felt like they set it up. You know, I can't say that for sure, obviously, but there was something about it that felt staged. Because Bald does this all the time when he was in, um, when he first met Timmy to begin the journey through the Darien Gap, they, they faked everybody out. Um, Timmy pretended to be drunk and just sleeping at a table in this outdoor cafe, and Bald pretended not to know who he was and then just kind of went up to him and sort of shook him awake and says, hey buddy, are you okay? Are you all right? And said to him, hey, I'm, I'm going through the Darien Gap, want to come along? And then they both played it um, real. They both pretended this was a real situation. And then Timmy was like pretending to be drunk and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll go with you. And they, they made it look like that's how they got together for the journey. But of course, they had planned this months in advance they, they both organized to meet there and then take the you know walk through the Darien Gap together. And um, at, when I first saw it, to be honest, I thought it was real. And it was only later on when I saw them interacting, I was like, there's, ah, there's no way that was real. And then I kind of did some research and I did some readings. Oh yeah, okay, that, they, that was just a, they just did that for fun. And they weren't really even trying to trick anybody. I think they just did it as a goof, assuming that everybody would know it was a goof. But I think a lot of people, like me, you know, initially thought it was real. And I was like, wow, Bald just found this drunk Greek guy in the market and at a cafe and just come with me. I was like, wow, that's so crazy. And a lot of people believed it was true. And then when, they, he was, when Bald was on the, uh, the launch in Bangladesh, he was going downriver on a, on a big ferry. It was the same ferry that I took. And um, he went out into some of the cabins on the ferry and he said, talking on the YouTube video, hey, let's see who else is on this boat. Let's go knock on some doors and talk to some other people. And he knocked on a door and opened it and another foreigner, backpacker Ben, a YouTuber, was inside that room and then Bald kind of treated it like it was a surprise. Like, oh, hey, backpacker Ben, you know, what are you doing here? I had no idea you were, you know, and they played it off like this was a, a coincidence that they were both on the same boat. But of course, they were traveling together. And anybody who watches their videos knows that the two of them travel together all the time. But again, he tried to just, he created this skit almost like a little bit of a performance. So I'd seen him do this a number of times. And... Um, so when he was in this hotel in Mexico, and then he says, oh yeah, Timmy, he's not feeling well. And then he went to you know, knock on the door, open the door, and there's Timmy, and Timmy's vomiting. It felt staged to me. I don't know for sure, but it seems like Bald, like he talked to Timmy and knew Timmy was sick, but then he says, hey, listen, why don't we get this on video and I'll go out, I'll come back in, and then you can you know, be really, really sick. You, know, well, you can pretend to vomit. Because even when he was vomiting, it didn't feel real to me. You know, he could easily have been vomiting as part of his sickness, I have no doubt. 
but the fact that he vomited at that exact moment when Bald came into the room, it, it felt staged to me. But there was no question in my mind that Timmy really was sick. He, he was sick and he wasn't able to continue on the journey. He and Bald were supposed to go out and get on the beast and ride the train with the migrants, but Timmy was so sick that he wasn't able to go. And to my surprise, uh, Bald left him there. Bald just abandoned him and said, uh, you know, he's talking on camera and he says, yeah, well, Timmy can't go. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue, but we're going to leave Timmy here. And I was listening to him say that and I was, I was honestly quite surprised because I, you know, I've been in similar situations, but on my own. I've been in other countries by myself um, and I, I became quite ill. I, have a, I think I have a pretty sensitive stomach, you know, with a lot of, you know, bad diarrhea and vomiting, things like that. You know, you eat something that doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't agree with you. And I've been in places where, yeah, you're, you're so sick, you're so weak, you can't even move. And then I, the bathroom would be outside my hotel room. It was, a, it was a hotel exactly like the ones they were staying in. And the bathroom would be down the hall and then I would end up practically, you know, limping and crawling to get to this bathroom. And it's just a, a cement room with a big water tank, you know, with a, with a bucket. And there's a hole in the ground and everything is wet and moldy and it's cement. And I would end up just lying on the ground. Like just, I was so weak, I would just lie on the floor. Because I know I'm going to be vomiting any second or have brutal diarrhea, so I can't really leave the bathroom. And I would just lie on this wet cement, and it was actually kind of comforting to be on that cold cement. You kind of, it feels, because you're kind of feverish and you're hot, and lying down on that cold cement feels good in a way. But it's a very depressing thing to be all by yourself in one of these cheap, hotel rooms, nobody knows where you are, and you're that sick. It's, it's a very kind of a stressful situation to be in. So I was kind of relating to that. Here's Timmy, sick in Mexico. He's there illegally, as far as I know, and um, in this very depressing, very sad, cheap hotel. But I was thinking, well, at least he has bald. So at least bald can stay there until he gets better, or take care of him, and then they can t continue their journey. But Bald, he just went, all right, see you later, good luck, and just left him there. And that seemed like such a heartless thing to do. I guess if you want to talk about, you know, bro code, they're both YouTubers, they're both adventure YouTubers, and they're, they've cultivated this reputation of being tough, independent, solo travelers who can live through anything. So from that point of view, maybe it makes sense that Timmy doesn't even want Bald to stay. You know, he wants to keep going with this, you know, tough, independent uh, attitude. And, um, but yeah, I mean, to be traveling with someone for whatever reason, and then your traveling companion gets that sick in a cheap hotel in the middle of nowhere, and then you just leave them there I don't know, that's, uh, I couldn't do it. Um, obviously you would stay until the other person feels better. That's just the way things are. But yeah, Bald just, uh, Bald just left him there. And again, I had to wonder, is Bald really this heartless? Or was this also staged? Because later on, Bald was down at the railroad tracks trying to get on the train, you know, trying to get on the beast. And then he got a message from Timmy saying he's coming. So eventually Timmy did feel good enough to leave that hotel and join Bald at the railroad tracks. So I, I, I don't know at this point, like how sick was he? And uh, did Bald really abandon him there? You know, it's like, oh, you're sick? See you later, you know, just leave him there. Or did they stage this whole thing just to add drama to the story? And they knew that Timmy was just going to rest up a few more hours and he was just going to leave the hotel later in the day and come join Bald wherever he was. I think that's really what happened, but they played it up like he was just going to leave him there.
And then that story got even more weird because for Bald's video, in the pinned comment, the number one comment, there's a story from Bald that says Timmy got so sick in Mexico that he had to have an operation. And that Timmy, he says in his comment that Timmy was still there, still under sedation, and his insurance doesn't cover this emergency operation. So he, Bald says to his viewers, you know, help Timmy out, go to his channel, watch his videos, and support him that way because he's in big trouble in Mexico. And again, that whole message really made no sense to me because Bald's video ends with them at the border with the U.S. He and Timmy, they both traveled all the way across Mexico. They're at the border. It's a border fence, and they're posing there you know, with their hand on the border fence and ending the video, talking about their adventure and everything they did. So they both made it all the way to the border with the U.S., and that's where the video ends. I have no idea what happened to either of them after that. Did they cross the border into the U.S.? Could they do it legally? Did they have to go back to Mexico City and fly out of the country? I have no idea what happened. But then he leaves that comment saying, in Mexico, or did he even say in Mexico? I don't know if he even gave that amount of detail. Let, let me double check what he said. So he doesn't say exactly that Timmy's in Mexico, but he implies it. Um, his exact words are, Unfortunately, our good friend and heroic caminante, Timmy Carter, fell very sick after I left Mexico and was hospitalized for an operation. His medical bills were not covered by his insurance and they were astronomical. He is now under sedation. If you want to help out, I ask you to go to his channel after this and watch a video or two of his leave a supportive message for him to read when he wakes up and drop some likes. So he doesn't say for sure that Timmy's in Mexico, but he does say Timmy fell sick after I left Mexico. I assume Timmy was still in Mexico when he fell sick, but it happened after Bald left. So Timmy stayed behind and had to get an operation. But it just, it, again, it's just the details are, are vague and it's a little bit weird. And he says he is now under sedation. So I, I don't know what that means. I mean, now under sedation? Like, did he go into a coma? That, I mean, that's kind of what it implies. But of course, for an operation, you go under sedation. And then after the operation, you know, the sedation wears off and you wake up. So, but why is he still under sedation now? That, that detail doesn't make, a, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But anyway, so this whole thing about Timmy Carter getting sick in the hotel, Bald abandoning him, the feeling that it was a little bit staged, and then Timmy rejoining him, and he was still sick. He had diarrhea the entire time that they, that they were out there on the beast. And then Timmy getting sick and needing an operation. So a lot going on there, but I really wish I knew more of the uh, specific details because a lot of it isn't very, uh, isn't very clear to me. And the journey itself, to me doesn't really live up to the hype because on that second day assuming this has just been two days um, they did get on a train with all these migrants they met up with a group of migrants and they were looking for they had information maybe there's a train here maybe there and they were going through the bush from train track to train track and um, avoiding the authorities and they eventually found a train I think it was stopped, yeah, and then, or maybe moving slowly, and then Bald and Timmy and the group of migrants they were with did climb onto the train and started the journey. But according to the video, it looked like they were on the train overnight, but I, I don't know how long they were on the train. They imply that it was a very long time and they talk about how cold it was and uh you know they had to wrap up in as much clothing as they had you know, timmy bought blankets or something like that wrapped himself up in blankets 
and then Bald and Timmy kind of chatted with other with the migrants on the roof of the train. A lot of interesting things happened. A lot of the conversations were interesting. They passed through areas where Mexican people were gathered at the side of the railroad tracks, like parts of like members of humanitarian groups. And as the train would pass, they would throw food and water and clothing and sweaters and jackets up to the migrants on the roof of the train. Um, so that was, that was very nice and then Bald shows that. And there was one woman there who had, that he showed had a, like a small, not a baby, but a toddler. And in order to keep the toddler on the roof, you know, they tied uh, like a blanket or a rope or a cord around the toddler's waist and then tied it off somewhere, so, you know, because there was a real risk of, you know, this train rocking and then toddlers in particular, young children would get thrown off the train. So it was a, you know, cold, uncomfortable, dangerous journey. And I'm really looking forward to Timmy Carter's video of this experience because I think he's going to show a lot more detail but I don't know how long they were on the train, but they eventually got to a point where I guess they had to get off that train and get on another one. That train went as far as it was going to go, but then Bald's train journey kind of ended there. The caminantes, the true migrants, they would just wait there until the next train came through. And, um, Bald was talking about how there's a rumor that there's going to be another train in nine hours. And then uh, he and Timmy basically went, nah, well, we can't wait for nine hours. So, you know, our journey is done. We're, we're going to end it here, you know. So they didn't really do the beast journey. I mean, the full journey of the Caminantes, it involves all of that. It involves misinformation, lack of information, getting on the wrong train, waiting at the side of the tracks for hours, if not days or weeks until the next train. And that, that, that is what the journey involves. That's where the dangers come from, getting on and off multiple trains, being out in the open, being exposed to the elements, to robbers, to authorities. And I guess there was one situation, again, they didn't show it, but the train that they were going to get on, the train that was, or there was a train coming, and I guess, well, Bald said that a train station employee came out with a bag and went to all the migrants asking for money and said, you guys have to pay me and then I will slow down the train. But if you don't pay me, the train won't slow down and you won't be able to get on. So they were extorting money from the migrants, the Mexican train employees, you know, um, demanding money so that the train would slow down for them. So they were exposed to a lot of dangers, a lot of extortion, a lot of that. But a lot of that comes from having to make the full journey and then you might have to stop here, wait for two days to get the next train, wait for nine hours for the next train. And the first time they reached a delay, Bald and Timmy just abandoned us. Yeah, okay, we, we've had enough. We got, we, got, we, we, got, we got a taste of what it's about and we don't need to keep going and they got off the train. But there was this really, really weird moment where they were talking about the trains and getting on, and then a, a train came by, and then Bald, I think he was again staging it, was pretending that he was gonna ride this train further to the north, because the train was moving at you know pretty fast pace, but then Bald ran beside the train and then grabbed, like found an open cart an open carriage, whatever you call it, and grabbed a piece of steel, a handle, and then jumped up and sat down. And was like, ah, I'm on the next train. And then he took video of Timmy running beside the train to catch it as well. And then Bald was shouting, you know, run, Timmy, run, 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 do it, do it. You know, you can do it, encouraging him. And then Timmy got on the train as well. And then Bald, you know, talked into his uh, Sony X3000 and says, yeah, we just hopped on the beast. We're on the beast and we could be killed. We could be murdered. We could be kidnapped. We could be robbed, extortion, on and on. And then that's where he ended the video. But I'm like 99% sure that as soon as he stopped recording that, he just hopped off the train again. Like they, they didn't really get on that train to climb on the roof. And, and keep riding. I think he just did that as a, as a dramatic way to end the video. He had no idea where that train was going. The other migrants didn't get on that train. So I think, I think Bald was like, oh, we have to wait nine hours for the next train. 
ah, can't do that. So let's just hop on the next train that goes through. I'll film a conclusion and then I can hop off again. And then the video smash cuts to him at the US border. So wherever they were, I, I don't think they'd even reached Mexico City yet. I think they were still way, way, way in the south of Mexico. They hadn't gone very far. And then the very next scene, he's at, at a fence anyway. He says he's at the US border. I mean, I'm so suspicious of this guy and his videos. I'm like, I don't even believe 100% that he was even at the border, but it was a big fence and it looked like it looked like the fence at the US border but he doesn't say how he got there um, cuz he just hopped off the train i'm sure way back south of mexico city and then he just would have traveled by bus or however he got to the border uh, he didn't walk the whole way and he didn't ride the trains the whole way probably who knows rented a car i don't know he and timmy basically just raced ahead to the border filmed the conclusion and then they were done right so yeah that was uh that was the beast it's an entertaining video you know it's fun it's interesting to watch and he did get a lot of um, information from people and um he was very generous with the people that he met so I'll, I'll say that he met up with some caminantes who were living in the like they were working in mexico trying to get enough money to get over the next stage of their journey and i guess there's all these migrants form communities and there's these very cheap guest houses it'd be a room like maybe smaller than my hotel room here but it would have four people living in a, in a room uh, probably half the size of this one on bunk beds and then paul paul you know showed where they were living and uh, found out from them that they were paying 35 dollars a week for that um for that room's like 140 dollars a month for that bunk bed in in one room sharing with three other people and then they're working at whatever jobs they can find to save money to keep on going and he met up with some other well the same people in the same building i think he went out and bought a big stack of large pizzas and uh beer and coke and drinks everything paid for all of that and then he brought it all to that building and they had a big pizza party with the, all the migrants and then he was asking them questions about where they were from and going through the Darien Gap and getting some of their stories. And he would talk to people on the train. And um, yeah, he showed a lot of interesting things. He, as I said, he didn't ride the train very long, but he did get up there, which is pretty amazing. Got up onto the train and uh, rode through part of the night anyway, and it was pretty cold. And you got to see the scene of all the Mexicans throwing water and food up to the migrants. That was very interesting to see. But of course, I, uh, me being me, I want more details. I want all the information. I want to know how he got through Central America exactly, how he got into Costa Rica, and then how did he move on from there? What forms of transportation? How did he deal with all the border crossings? Why did he show only the border crossing from Guatemala into Mexico. Why not document all the border crossings? Like, I don't understand any of that. So, but anyway, those are, that is my uh, YouTube story for this morning. Technology Roundup today involves a little bit of shopping because I have this uh, MacBook Pro that's my my beast the beast and i've been using this uh, hub so this is a usb-c hub that plugs into the macbook and then it gives you two usb-c ports a memory card reader like micro sd and full-sized sd and then two usb-a ports and it, it burned out it doesn't work anymore i don't know how these things burn out but anyway it burned out it gets got really really hot and i guess it short circuited or something and now it no longer works so i've been looking for a, a solution i have a whole bunch of adapters and cables and i can plug one thing in at a time so if i need to copy video files from a memory card to my laptop i don't need a hub I can just plug it into a USB-C port because this laptop has two USB-C ports and that's it. 
So you know, if, I, if I have a memory card, I can plug it in with a memory card reader and copy it, that's fine. If I want to plug in a external hard drive, like a two terabyte external drive, I can do that. I have adapters. I can plug it into the USB-C port and copy to and from the hard drive. But the one thing I can't do and that I really need to do is to copy directly from a memory card from the memory card to an external hard drive. I need to do that because the hard drive on my Mac is really small. There isn't enough memory there. So if I go out shooting video with my GoPro and I have all the, all the video, or with my Olympus camera, and I have all the video on a memory card, I need to copy it to my external drives for storage. I can't copy it to my laptop's hard drive. So I have to go from memory card to external drive. And the only way I can do that is with a hub because I can plug in the memory card into the hub and I can plug in the external drive into the hub and then the data flows from the memory card through the computer back out into the external drive. And with this burned out, I was unable to do that. So I've been uh, looking around, shopping around for a replacement. And of course that sent me down all kinds of rabbit holes. All these things are far more complicated than you would think. This is a special kind that doesn't use a cable. It, it, it plugs directly into the laptop and that's why it's so thin and it's meant to be like an extension of your laptop. And I just assumed I'd just buy another one of these. It worked fine until it stopped working, but I couldn't find any of these anywhere. I, I couldn't find any that were uh, for sale. So that got me looking at ones with a cable. So they're designed if you're sitting, you know, at a, at a, at a desk or on a table and your laptop is sitting flat and then you just plug in the cable and then you get a big hub at the end of the cable and that hub will have you know all these ports and all these memory card slots and things like that. So it was hard to find one because I needed a certain collection of, I needed for one thing, I needed a memory card slot. A lot of them only had USB-C or USB-C ports or USB-A ports and that's it. Other ones would have HDMI and USB-A. So they all had combinations of different things, some of which I needed and some of which I didn't need. And I needed USB-C, USB-A, and SD card and micro SD card. So I needed all of that. And that narrowed my choices down. And in the end, the one I picked out, there were cheaper ones out there, I guess but I've heard from a lot of people that when I, well, I've had the experience myself that when you're talking about cables and adapters and hubs, quite often the cheap ones just don't work. Like if you want to plug in a microphone or something, you buy the $3 cable that you find on Lazada and it you know, gets shipped to your house and then you plug it in and the microphone won't work. But then you buy you know, the original $30 adapter from Samsung or something or from whatever big company that made your microphone or made your smartphone use that cable in theory it's the exact same one as the cheap one you bought but the the, the expensive one will work and the cheap one won't work um, so you might have wasted your money anyway looking for one with all the features I needed and um, going a little bit more expensive, I ended up with a brand called J5 Create. And this one cost 200 ringgit, which is pricey because you can see something similar to this for maybe like 50 ringgit out there. But um, yeah, that's the one I bought. It's the J5 Create multi-port hub. And it's not perfect for me because it only has one USB-C port and oddly enough that USB-C port is only for power. Logically I can't figure this out. On this one my original has two. One is marked for power and the other one is a data port. So I end up with at least one USB-C port. On this one all the ones that I saw they do have a USB-C port 
but it's all marked as it says power in and on the box it will say optional power and logically or it says pass through charging okay and one of the reasons this one is so expensive and one of the reasons I bought it as opposed to the other ones is for pass through charging this one delivers a hundred watts of power and the cheaper ones were like 60 watts so like do I even need a hundred watt versus 60 I don't know but anyway hundred seemed better I don't, I don't know what kind of power I need to drive this beast and it felt like though I needed a hundred watts so that's why I got this one but it, yeah it talks about pass-through power optional power but what I wanted to know was is it also a data port because I plug power directly into the laptop. I don't need power from this thing. I, I, I have two USB-C. I plug the, you know, the MacBook adapter plugs directly into one USB-C port. I plug this one into the other one and then I don't need power here. I don't need power from this. So I was hoping that this would just be a normal USB-C port. But nobody could tell me. Like, it doesn't, doesn't specify on the boxes. You look at the reviews online, nobody talks about this. I, you know, at all the electronic stores that I visited, you know, the clerks were pretty knowledgeable. They knew a lot about these things. But that one question I kept asking is like, okay, it says power in USB-C, but can it also be used as a data port? Because on my MacBook, this USB-C port is both. E there's two ports. Each one I can plug the power into or a flash drive or something. It, it's a data port and a power port in one. And this one I just assumed, well, why not? It must be a data port as well as a power port. Why wouldn't it be? But nobody could answer that question. And in the end, all I could do was take a chance and just buy the thing. And it does have something I don't need. Again, it's pretty expensive, but partially because it has an HDMI out as well. I think a lot of the cost is poured into that. It says it has um, USB-C to 4K HDMI. And I think that's why it's relatively expensive. And um, yeah, I don't know anything about HDMI. I've never used it, and I, I'll probably never use this. But this was the only one I could find that had the other ports that I needed. So I had no choice but to also get HDMI. So anyway, so I bought it. And after I bought it, I brought it back here. And the other question I had was, well, will it work in a smartphone? Like it's a great little hub adapter for memory cards and things. I can use it with my MacBook, but is it like an OTG device? Will it work if I plug it into a smartphone? Because that would make it handy as well. And again, nobody could tell me that at all the stores. They had no idea. It was like no one had ever asked them that question. Um, and I had to become my own investigator again. And um, they did say something on here that hinted that it might um, work that way. Here on the front, yeah, it says display port alt mode compatible. I was looking at that and I was showing it to the clerks like alt mode compatible. What the heck is that? And I started to think, well, maybe this is related to plugging into a smartphone. Like it has an alternative mode. And I did find one clerk who said, yeah, that's what it means. If you want to be able to plug it into a phone, you have to buy one that is alt mode compatible. That's what that means, he told me. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's, that's, that's what we landed on. And then so I brought it back here. It's beautifully made, made in Taiwan. Maybe J5 Create is a Taiwanese company feels very solid very high quality i wanted a longer cable because i'm always sitting here with my laptop like this and now if i plug this into my laptop it's dangling from my laptop i wanted like a cable that's twice as long but it seems to be okay so i brought it back here i plugged it in and i started playing around with it and i had so many questions i needed to answer because as i said nobody in the world could answer my questions because, well, would it work with a phone? I plugged it into my phone, yes, it does work. So that was amazing. But of course, a phone is very different from a laptop. And with the phone, of course, 
you can only plug in one device at a time. So even though it has an SD card and a micro SD and a USB-A, you can't plug in a memory card and a you know, external drive at the same time. You can only use one memory card or one external drive. So you can only use one of these ports at a time when you plug it into a phone, which makes sense because that's just how phones work. But again, on the laptop, I also wanted to know when I was buying this thing, well, how many things can I plug in at one time? Like, could I, in theory, plug in all of them, an SD card, micro SD card, and two external hard drives? Can I have all of those plugged in at the same time? And then will my laptop be able to access all of them and copy files from one to the other? Nobody could answer that question either. So I had to do my own test. I plugged it in and then I just started raising the ante. You know, I plugged in one, uh, you know, micro SD card. Ah, my laptop could read it. So yes, that works. Then I put it in an SD card. Hey, it showed up too. So now I've got two of them listed on my uh, finder. Then I plugged in an external drive and another external drive and they all showed up on my laptop. So I answered my own question that with this J5 Create, you can have all of the slots occupied with a device and all of them are readable and writable at the same time when this is plugged into a MacBook Pro. So that was great news. So far so good. And my last question that nobody could answer was the power port. Is it also a display port? And so far my conclusion is no. It is display port, a uh, data port. But my conclusion is no. It is not a data port. I did some experiments. If I plug this into my laptop and then I plug the power into this USB-C, the power works. The power gets through this thing 100 watts, apparently, and it can power my computer. But if I have the power on my other port and then I put in a USB-C plug in here, it doesn't register. So like a flash drive, external drive, memory card reader, none of those things so far are registering through this. So it's power only and not a data port, which is very disappointing. But hey, I did my best. I did as much research as I could. I asked as many people as I could, but nobody could tell me yes or no to that question. All I could do was buy one and take a chance. But, but there is a workaround because as I mentioned, the USB-C on my laptop, there's two of them. Both of them are dual power and data. So what I can do is take the power, plug it into here, plug this into my laptop. Now the power is going through this and that frees up one other USB-C port on my laptop and I can use that as a data port. So if I absolutely, absolutely need a USB-C port, I can funnel the power through this thing and that will free up one of the ports on my laptop. So that was my adventure buying one of these things and uh, yeah, I like it. So far it's working out really well. Maybe someday I'll even be happy that I have an HDMI out on here. Maybe someday I'll actually use that, who knows. I doubt it though. They did have one other version of this, was the older version of the exact same one, but it also had a 3.5 millimeter jack. So exactly the same as this one, but also a 3.5 millimeter jack for a microphone or headphones. And I thought about getting that one, but I, I don't think I would ever use it. Um, this laptop has a 3.5 millimeter jack. It's one of the few things this laptop does have and I almost never use the one that's in the computer itself. I, can, I can't think of a time when I would ever need two of them. And even if I had two of them, I don't think you can't plug in two things at the same time anyway. Like if I thought maybe I could plug headphones into one and a microphone in the other but my experience with the MacBook is that that's not going to work anyway. So there's no point. And the old version of this that has the audio jack was much bigger. 
wider and longer and heavier. And I thought, eh. And uh, it was the old one that they were selling off, right? So I, they were telling me that the new one is much higher quality and it's smaller and lighter and better made. So I went for the new one without the 3.5 millimeter audio jack. So that was one uh, technology adventure. And the other one involved spending more money, which I was not happy to do, but it needed to be done. I wanted to replace this. This is a chest harness for a GoPro. So this is what I've been using. I, I, you know, I put on this big harness around my chest and shoulders and then this thing sits here and then you mount the GoPro on this. So your, you know, your hands are free and I have a GoPro sitting on my chest. And I've had this for years. I've used it a lot. It works fine, it works well, but it has a lot of problems. Um, the main one is it's just heavy. The straps are really thick, uh, very kind of cheap. This is, this is like a, a third party model. Um, like you could probably buy one of these for $10, $15 or something like that. It, I mean, it's, it works, it's good enough. I've used it a lot, but it's a bit heavy, a bit thick. And the buckle that seals it at the front is like a big, thick, you know, Fastex buckle. And it sticks out, quite makes the whole unit quite thick. And it was kind of a loose buckle. The buckle was like, like rattling around. I had to wrap electrical tape around it to make it so it doesn't make any noise. And it's so old and I've used it so many times that the elastic is starting to lose its elasticity. It's because it gets soaked in sweat every time I use it and it gets very hot and it's starting to fall apart. And the plastic, it has plastic here that rests against your skin and it, the sewing is not very um, precise. There's like a really hard edge here that's very jagged and sharp. And then you can feel all these sh sharp edges against your skin. So anyway, I've been thinking for a long time that the GoPro chesty would be better and i i never got around to buying one because you know for budget reasons i already have a chest harness and the any gopro accessory is really expensive so every time i was in a store and i saw the harness i was like um oh, nah 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 but i finally i was in a really good mood the other day i guess if i was feeling free spirited or something and I was in a camera store, uh, Camera Valley. And I, so I dropped by Camera Valley. There's a guy there that I really like, a clerk. He's like, um, <laughs> in terms of going into a store as a customer and just talking about cameras in general, he's the one camera store clerk in all of KL that can keep up with me. And he seems even more interested in conversation than I am. So I go in there to you know, look at what they have and, and he want, he's so eager to talk about cameras, you know, this camera model, what you know, good features, pros, cons, this one, pros and cons, comparing this to that, what about this tripod, what about, you know, he'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. So, you know, yeah, I love going there. Anyway, while I was there and I was talking to this guy and it turned out they had a GoPro chesty on display. So I thought, okay, if I'm ever going to buy one, this is the time to do it. Because if I ever did decide to buy it, at that time, every camera store I go to, they won't have the GoPro chesty. Like in Loyat Plaza, I looked everywhere for one. And in all the big mega stores, they didn't carry it. They only had the GoPro chesty inside a big travel adventure kit where you, you have to buy other accessories along with it and a, ca a case and all these things. So I couldn't buy it separately. I did find it at one store, but I resisted buying it and it seemed kind of expensive. But then I went to Camera Valley. They had a much better price, um, like 40% less than at Loyette Plaza. And I was having such a good time talking with this guy. And he spent so much time talking to me as a customer I thought that it was kind of rude now to leave without buying at least something. So there it, there it is. I bought the GoPro Chesty.
and it's better in every way. It's actually even better than I thought it was. Um, the, the part that sits on your chest is made of a nice cloth. Um, kind of, it has um, a nice pattern on it, soft and cushiony, and it, air is supposed to be able to flow around it. it. has no sharp edges. There's no plastic cutting into your skin, so that's very nice. The straps are strong and thin. The sewing is perfect, so there's no like sharp edges in the sewing. The edges of the material don't cut into your skin. Um, everything about it is high quality. And best of all, the buckle is like razor thin. You know, I mentioned how the, the, the buckle on this one is really big and thick. It's the kind of buckle you get on a backpack, you know, like a waist belt on a big backpack. This great big, you know, heavy, cheap buckle. But GoPro fixed that problem by designing their own buckle, which is like razor thin and it's really wide. And it clips in here at the front somewhere like that and it just keeps everything nice and thin and has a beautiful release mechanism very soft and smooth and gentle so yeah 200 ringgit what did I, I paid no I paid 188 so they their price was 188 ringgit after spending 200 on this another 188 is like ah. Uh, I, you know, but I bit the bullet. It's something I've been thinking that I needed for a long, long time. So I think I'm going to get a lot of use out of it. So I thought, okay, it's time. Get one. So I did get it. The one I saw at Loyette Plaza, the one there was, two, I think it was 260, 260 ringgit. And this one was 188. They were having kind of a promotion. So I am now the proud owner of a GoPro Chesty. I really had to adjust the straps though. When it came out of the box, I just tried to put it on right away. And I started to feel like the Incredible Hulk because it wouldn't fit. It was just like so tight. It was like, man, is this thing made for a child? It was so small. But then of course, all the straps are adjustable. But then I had to keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've just about maxed out the straps. Like there's almost no more adjustment that I can make and then I'm putting it on and it just barely fits me so I thought man this is a small version and I thought like am I am I like bigger and more muscular than I realized like I, I think I'm a relatively skinny dude you know I'm not like a barrel chested uh, strong man so how in the world so the, the, the straps did strike me as kind of short and it's just luck I mean I think there's a there's a little bit more adjustment I can make. So if I do start putting on muscle, you know, I can adjust it a little bit more, but it's pretty close. So for a big man, you know, who has a lot of you know, weight around his chest, you might have to test one of these out to make sure that it can even fit your body because it seemed, uh, yeah, seemed kind of short to me. So there we are. Technology adventures on Planet Doug. All right, that is it for Life on Planet Doug this morning. What did I talk about today? Oh yeah, the, uh, my Christmas arrangements. I had all kinds of crazy ideas originally. As I said, I thought about going to Taiwan for Christmas, going to the Philippines, Bangladesh, Vietnam. And then I guess through uh, poor planning and lack of imagination and a, a little bit of lack of uh, budget, I ended up going for something a little bit simpler and I'm going to go to uh, northern Sumatra, uh, Medan, Lake Toba, perhaps Banda Aceh, Pulau Way. I'm going to do like a, and I want to do a quicker trip. My usual habit is to go places and stay places for a long time, but this time I'm, I'm trying to get my backpack, you know, all set up and then I can just, you know, I, don't, I no longer have a bicycle to worry about. I don't know if I'll be renting a scooter or not. I, I don't really have the budget for that. 
It'd be nice, probably. I may do it for a few days, but the idea is to just backpack around using local transportation. And uh, I'm kind of excited about that. Maybe um, go to Lake Toba, and then from there go to the North Banda Aceh, and then maybe I can return to Malaysia by ferry again because I, I don't really want to fly if I can help it. So anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. And uh, from that point of view, I've been doing a little bit of packing and organizing because, you know, backpack on your back. Um, it can get heavy pretty fast, especially for me. But I'm trying to keep it under control, but I'm, I'm, sl I'm weighing everything that I want, might want to bring with me. And it's amazing how heavy things become. I've started keeping track. I've got a notepad open and I'm assembling all of my stuff into, into groups and then weighing that set of gear to see, you know, where, where is the weight. And I just started that process, so I, I don't really have a lot of information. But for example, I was looking at um, like my backpack alone. It's the Osprey Farpoint Trek 75. It weighs four pounds, just the backpack. Then the rain cover and the security cover that goes over the backpack, that weighs 0.8 pounds. So you're kind of looking at five pounds just for the backpack when it's empty. And it, it's a big backpack. It's kind of designed for trekking, you know, carrying tons of stuff and um, camping gear. And I have my Olympus camera. So I've got my Olympus camera and I've got my action camera. Those are my two camera groups. And I put together my Olympus camera. I have two lenses and a tripod grip and the batteries and the battery charger. You put together the entire Olympus package that comes to another four pounds, 1.9 kilograms. So that's just for the Olympus. The action camera, to my surprise, is quite a bit heavier because I've got two GoPros, the Insta360 X3, and then I have a variety of mounting apparatus. You know, I've got my JAWS Flex Clamp, and I have a GoPro three-way grip, which I really like. And then I have the Insta360 invisible selfie stick. Um, and then I, I'm, I have with me just a couple of mounts, just in case I do ride a scooter or a bike, I, and I want to mount a camera, I need something to mount to the handlebars. So into my backpack, I threw a couple of these big jaws and these sort of heavy duty um, ram mount systems with ball, ball heads on them. You, nothing else works. Um, once you start mounting GoPros or any kind of camera onto handlebars of a scooter or a bike, like simple little grips don't work. You need the heavy duty stuff. So I, I threw um, an assortment of those in, not, not everything I own, but uh, some of those. And then, of course, microphones, cables, chargers, batteries, all of that. And then, once I put all that together, my, Go my GoPro package comes to 7.7 .7 pounds. And that's as far as I've gotten in terms of weighing. But, like, right out of the gate, you know. I mean, now, the next thing I'll weigh will be my electronics, because that doesn't include my laptop, tablet, smartphones, and then all the uh, you know, batteries, chargers, um, you know, portable hard drives for all the video files. Put all of that together, I think that's going to be 10 pounds or more than 10 pounds, I think. There's a lot of stuff there. So that's all the electronics. And that I still haven't, you know, mentioned, like, there's no, so far, no clothing, you know, toiletries and stuff like that. So... Yeah, if you removed all of the electronics and all of the camera gear from, you know, a backpack, I mean, I'd have nothing left. <laughs> it's like 90% of what I carry around with me is just camera gear, computer gear, and electronics. Like, if you, if you took all of that out of your life, man, you could uh, travel very, very lightly. But anyway, I'm playing around with that, and then over the next couple of days, I'll see if... Uh, once I put all of this into my backpack, can I still lift it? Can I carry it? Yeah, I think I'll be able to. So I've done it in the past, and it's not a big, it's not a big problem for me. 
I know in the world of travelers and backpackers, there's a real eagerness to travel light, and I understand the attraction. It would be nice to travel lighter, you know, have less stuff. You feel freer. Yeah, guys like Bald and Bankrupt are just like a real mystery to me. I'm wondering how in the world can he do what he does. When I see him shooting one of these, you know, YouTube videos, he has his X3000 camera, and then he has a little knapsack on his back that, as far as I can tell, has next to nothing in it. It's like, how in the world can you do that? So I think there's a story there somewhere. Anyway. Yeah, once I uh, pack up everything I need just to shoot video, yeah, my backpack is, uh, you know, I'm going to need some muscles to uh, carry that around. So I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah, so that is it for uh, all my stories. And then I, um, yeah, I, I booked my flight to Medan. I've already paid for it. That's booked. And then I don't know, I don't have a route through northern Sumatra as yet. I'm still thinking this through. There is a, well, maybe I won't talk about that right now. I'll save that for another video more in depth, I guess, to talk about that. But I also have my visa on arrival. Ah, after all that work, I have it. I have it on my phone. And I've already made copies of it and made backup copies of it. So I, 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 I won't lose it or anything like that. So all set to go. All right, that's it. Shutting down for now and... Uh, Thanks for keeping me company as I talk about my life and everything going on, and I'll see you in the next video.